Recently, I purchased this Lenovo P50 workstation laptop from a local auction. It's built like a tank and honestly cost a lot of money when it was originally released. But is it still useful today? Let's find out. Here is the laptop which cost me 220 Australian dollars or the equivalent of 150 US. For my money, I got a laptop with a 6th gen quad core i7 processor, 8GB of RAM and a 256GB SSD. The one defect the listing mentioned was one of the side USB ports not functioning, which isn't all that surprising considering how heavily it appears they have been used. The rubberized coating on the lid has its fair share of scratching and generally the casing shows many signs of wear. With this being a Lenovo laptop, it carries the tradition of the red pointer nub much to my delight. And if if you like your laptop to be a bit flexible, the screen can be pivoted over 180 degrees. But let's now see if it's still functional. It boots straight into an unactivated version of Windows 10, and hopefully I can use its original Windows 7 product key to activate it, provided it has one hidden somewhere. And today's video wouldn't be possible without your phone and their recently released 18T rugged smartphone. This truly has some great features on top of being a really durable phone. The battery life is also incredible. The capacity is a whopping 9600 milliamp hour. And it's got a diverse range of optics, including a FLIR thermal imaging camera and a microscope lens. There's also 5G cellular connectivity, a 120 hertz display and 66 watt wide fast charging. The programmable button on the side is also a nice nifty feature. Oh, and this phone also has a headphone jack. This is really a Swiss army knife of a phone and there's even an endoscopic camera attachment. So if you're after a tough, feature-rich smartphone with battery life for days, this is seriously one to consider. Links are in the description and the comments if you want to know more. It's a really solid feeling device with a 4GB NVIDIA Quadro M2000M graphics chip, which will hopefully allow me to run some games and potentially do some video editing. Under load, the air exhaust reads about 60 degrees Celsius, with the keyboard area only reaching 40, which didn't feel very warm when typing. So let's clean it up, redo the thermal paste and put in some more RAM. I recorded temperature readings and game performance so we can get a good before and after comparison. And here are the four sticks of RAM I'll be putting in. Yes, this has four RAM slots, only one of them is currently being used. To begin the disassembly, as well as gain access to the drives and half the RAM slots, I removed the back cover. With only one stick of RAM being used, performance would have been suffering to a degree without the use of a dual channel configuration. There is room for two M.2 SSDs and a SATA drive, or you can run dual 2.5 inch SATA drives with the relevant adapters. The CR2032 BIOS battery is also very easy to get access to with this ThinkPad, but to get in further, you've got to remove several screws, and I'd highly recommend keeping track of their locations as there are many different types. With every single screw removed, I could then flip the entire laptop over. By shifting the keyboard upward, I could lever it out and be sure to disconnect the ribbon cables underneath. This is where you get access to the other RAM slots. If you only wanted access to your RAM, you'd only need to remove the screws on the underside that are marked with the keyboard icon. But since we are digging in deeper, I removed all the screws which allowed me to remove the top casing. And be sure to unplug the trackpad, fingerprint reader and power button connector before lifting it off. Now we've got a good look at the drainage hole designed to channel liquids spilt on the keyboard out of the device. And to separate the screen and top part of the chassis, several more screws needed to be taken out. I decided to keep the display attached to the casing to save time. This way I didn't have to remove the tape routing all the screen connectors to the motherboard. And here is the motherboard with the decent looking cooling solution. This should be adequate for the CPU and GPU in this machine. With every screw loosened, the whole assembly lifted out easily. The fans really look quite dusty and it'll be interesting to see just how much we can improve the temperatures. It looks as if the intake area was somewhat clogged up as well. The original thermal paste, which would have been about six years old, was quite hard. And this is something I'd suggest changing at least every few years, especially if you use a gaming laptop. You never know the quality of paste that was originally used. And to help remove the old stuff, I'm using some isopropyl alcohol. And be sure to remove the paste on the cooler as well. Having the surface free of debris is super important. The small thermal pads used for GPU memory and I believe CPU VRMs seems fine, so I'll leave those as they are. Next up are the fans which required me to remove some tape and a few tiny screws. There was a bit of carpet forming, nothing too drastic though, and people with allergies might want to look away now. 
And now for my favorite part, the dusting. The fans in here had a bit of dirt build up on the blades, and I'm not sure that this affects their efficiency much, but it makes me feel a whole lot better seeing them clean. And if your computer is starting to overheat or performance is somewhat reduced, the fans are a likely culprit. I went through and dusted out the casing, which unsurprisingly had a fair share of debris. The keyboard was also in need of a good sanitizing after I've reassembled the laptop. The risers on the back prevent me from putting much pressure on it. Now for the reassembly, I applied Arctic MX4 paste. The dies are pretty small, so they don't require much to adequately transfer the heat. The cleaned out fans and heatsink could now be carefully screwed back on. This is really an easy laptop to work on, and I'm very impressed so far. For the price, you really do get a lot, and I'd suggest looking at local auctions for decommissioned business laptops. Lenovo's such as this one come up pretty often, usually including the charger and upgraded RAM. The most cost-effective way for me to get 16GB of RAM was actually to put in four four gigabyte sticks. I can now sell the original eight gigabyte stick off locally. It's also best to use matching pairs, so I shouldn't, for instance, use the eight gigabyte stick alongside one of these four gigabyte single-sided sticks. And here we have the laptop back in one piece again, including the little screw covers. Using some eucalyptus oil, I wiped off the top lid, which reduced the appearance of grime and scratches quite a bit. The keyboard area also benefit from a wipe down. I also dusted around the keys to get rid of gunk. The last part to need cleaning was the display surface. I used some lens cleaner and a clean microfiber cloth to get it looking pretty good once again. Now for the moment of truth. Does it still work and will it recognize the new RAM? It thankfully does. All four sticks are now being used a total of 16 gigabytes. So how about activating Windows? There's no need to shell out for a license as it appears to have an unused one under the battery. A Windows 7 Pro key will activate this Pro version of Windows 10, which is really helpful. I typed in the key and success, it's now activated. So let's see just what this machine is capable of, starting off with some games. BeamNG Drive at a resolution of 1600 by 900 averaged 73 frames per second, improving ever so slightly after the cleanout. This is absolutely playable, and even though the graphical fidelity is set to low, it still looks pretty nice. Next, I jumped onto my Minecraft server, and playing at 1080p was quite easy for this ThinkPad. It had no trouble reaching well over 200 frames per second. Horizon Zero Dawn's benchmarking test pushed it pretty hard, but still resulted in a usable 32 frames per second average. PUBG on low at 900p was constantly getting just above 60 frames per second. I found this very good to play with. Even on low graphical settings, this game still looks pretty good, and at 900p, it's still pretty sharp on this 15-inch display. We were even able to bring home a chicken dinner. Peak CPU temperatures under sustained load dropped a whole 20 degrees Celsius, and the GPU while running PUBG went from 75 to a peak afterwards of just 61 degrees. These are incredibly good results, but how does it fare with other tasks? Typing up documents felt great. Lenovo once again put an excellent keyboard in here, and as far as video editing is concerned, the extra RAM was definitely necessary, but it still wasn't as fluid as I would have liked. Perhaps it would have performed faster with a better solid state drive. Either way, this is still a powerful 15 inch notebook in a relatively slim chassis. Most games will run at acceptable frame rates at lower graphical settings, and the port selection is pretty up to date, even featuring a Thunderbolt Type-C connector. So even though this was really cheap, do I have any complaints? Well, yes, Lenovo did offer this with multiple grades of displays. This one, being the worst, with a peak brightness of 220 nits and honestly horrible coverage of pretty much every color space. This low brightness does limit you to indoor use, and I guess it helps with the battery life to a degree. The 90 watt hour pack in here is quite decent, still giving me around 4 hours of general use. So should you buy one of these? Well, if you do lots of typing and also want to dabble in a few games, this is absolutely still a viable option. So there we have it, a reasonably priced workstation laptop that's still usable today and you can game on it to a certain extent. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed the video. Lenovo really made a quality product here, and it's definitely standing the test of time. I'll see you in the next one.